So at this point, I'm going to hand things over to my co-chair, Dong Yun Zhu, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, good morning and welcome again. Uh, it's my honor to introduce this year's uh, keynote speaker, Professor David Wagner, who received the 2016 SIGSAC Outstanding Innovation Award in Vienna. We, uh, the program co-chairs, we joked that he's got a very good deal because he had an entire year to prepare his keynote speech today. Uh, David is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley. Uh, he has published more than 100 peer-reviewed high-impact research papers in scientific venues uh, and uh, co-authored two books on uh, encryption and computer security. Uh, David and his team has analyzed and helped improve the security of cellular networks, 802.11 wireless network, electronic voting machine, and other widely deployed real-world systems. So before handing it over to David, I have a personal confession. So many years ago, when I was still a graduate student, uh, I was first exposed to the area of software security by reading uh, Professor Wagner's classic paper on automatic detection of buffer overflow. So now, without further ado, Professor David Wagner. All right, so in honor of Halloween, I'm going to show you some spooky properties of machine learning. And I gather it's traditional at these kind of talks to talk about your own work, but I decided I didn't want to do that. So instead, what I'm going to try to do is show you a survey of a couple of favorite papers I've read in this area that I've really been enjoying, and I hope you'll enjoy them too. So let's talk about machine learning. Uh, machine learning is... Um, starting to see growing use in a wide variety of domains and holds a lot of promise for um, future of technology, including things like autonomous vehicles, uh, robotics, um, uh, improving our ability to interact with, with computers. Um, but the problem, as I'm going to show you in this talk, is that uh, modern methods for machine learning are fragile. They're fragile against attack. Um, especially deep learning, which seems to be the state-of-the-art technique for uh, many of these problem domains. So let me show you some examples of what I mean by that, and many of you have maybe seen these before. That picture on the left is a school bus. That picture on the right, what is it? Well, it turns out, if you ask the classifier that was used to evaluate this, it says, Oh yeah, on the left, that's a school bus. On the right, that's a hummingbird. Can you see the difference between those two images? I sure can't. So what happened here was that the image on the right was deliberately modified from the image on the left in an imperceptible way to fool the classifier. Okay, so you have a classifier that's very good at recognizing objects unless someone is deliberately crafting the image, in which case it can be fooled by images that to you and I look like so obviously still a school bus. All right, so this is the machine equivalent of optical illusions for the classifier. And if you wanna see how this happens, here's an example of turning uh, an image of a school bus into an ostrich. Every pixel gets, intensity gets modified a little bit. It's so little that I can't show you. So I had to magnify by a factor of 10. And there's the change that you have to. So you can see it's making changes to all the pixels of the image. And you can come up with many examples. Here's some other examples from some papers in the literature. For instance, on the train classifier to recognize things are cars versus not. On the left, there's an image of a car. On the right is a modified version of that image modified so the classifier will no longer recognize it's a car. To you and me, obviously still the same image. Some more recent work. On the left, there's something that a classifier that's trained to recognize road signs recognizes as a stop sign. On the right, modified by an attack presented here. So the classifier thinks that's a yield sign. So you can start to imagine reasons why we might care about these attacks. Maybe this could be used to mislead a self-driving car and send it off the road. 
You could imagine if in the future we have automated surveillance systems, maybe we could craft special camouflage clothing so that it no longer recognizes I'm a person and thinks I'm a deer or something harmless. Um, you can imagine starting to fool uh, classifiers used to recognize malware to, so that the adversary can cloak their malware and make it look like a benign binary. While we're on road signs, here's another recent result from this year. Um, you can even make these uh, these fooling images robust so that even with a distortion and that's introduced by cameras, taking an image in the real life with variations in lighting, it still robustly fools a classifier. And there's two examples of uh, road signs that were crafted to be recognized by the classifier. In this case, I think this was uh, maybe a speed limit 60 miles an hour sign, some, something like that. Uh, turns out um, you can also attack uh, voice recognition systems in this way. And our group had, uh, had uh, showed how you could do that, how you can come up with a, a sound that will, will fool a voice uh, activated command system into thinking that some human is commanding it to take some action. And here's an example of one. Let's see if you can hear it. All right, so that's something that's crafted to fool the Google Now into thinking that was a command. Could you tell what that said? That's a command that's recognized as saying, OK, Google, browse to evil.com. Once I tell you what it was, you might actually be able to hear it. So I'll play it again and see if you can. Isn't that an interesting psychoacoustic phenomenon? Once you know what to listen for, you can hear it. OK, so um, how does that work? Same deal. Um, underlying the covers of all of these uh, speech recognition systems is another machine learning classifier. And you can apply similar attacks to craft modifications. In this case, we were trying to craft not an imperceptible small modification, but a large modification, so large that you could no longer perceive um, what this was a command. OK, um, I en encourage you to heckle, interject, ask questions, interrupt. Love to have some interaction, so don't be shy. Um, I thought what I'd do is I'd tell you about how some of these attacks work and some other work on security of, of neural networks and deep learning. But before I do that, I thought I would teach you how deep learning works. How many of you feel like you have some idea how deep learning works? OK. So this is for the rest of you. This is the kindergarten level introduction. Let's start by talking not about neural networks, but about optimization. Over the past few decades, there's been a bunch of work on how to do mathematical optimization. So let's imagine we have a function like this, f of x. Um, and we want to find a minimum of this function. We want to find x that makes f of x as small as possible. How might you do that? Well, there's a variety of techniques in the literature. One of them is gradient descent. And in gradient descent, it's basically start somewhere on this graph, put your finger somewhere on that curve, and walk downhill. OK, so if I start on the right, then downhill is to the left, and so I start walking to the left. And how do you tell which direction is downhill? You, if you've taken cal calculus one, you know how to tell. You take the derivative, and you look at the derivative. In this case, the derivative is, neg uh, is positive, so the slope is down to the left, and so we walk to the left. OK, so that's called gradient descent. And um, using these techniques, if you know how to evaluate f at any x of your choice, and you know how to evaluate its derivative, then you can use that to find a minimum for f of x. And this works in higher dimensions, too. So if I have a function of many variables, you can apply the same techniques as long as you have a way to compute its derivative or its gradient. And there's been a tremendous amount of work on how to make this work really well and be efficient and fast. And this is uh, one of the tools that um, neural networks build on. A neural network you can think of as just a function. It's a function that takes a bunch of inputs, continuous real numbers, and outputs a number. All right. And there's a whole bunch of structure going on. An 
and it has some parameters that are tunable. But don't worry about the structure. You don't really need to know it for this talk. What you can do for the neural network is you can think of it as advanced curve fitting. Okay, so suppose I have some inputs xi and some outputs yi, and I want f of xi to roughly go through yi. Okay, so this is basically curve fitting. If I wanted f to be a line, this would be linear regression, but I maybe no longer require f to be a straight line. I allow it to be curvy. And maybe my x's are multidimensional. Okay. How do you do that? Well, basically, we're going to use optimization. We're going to use this minimization technique that I told you about. We're going to craft an objective function, h, that tells me how good f is. How close does it come to passing through those points? And I showed you a simple example of an objective function. And then we're going to find a minimum of that objective function. We're going to try to find f that makes that objective as small as possible. And I told you we know how to minimize things, so we're just going to apply all the machinery we know for minimizing things. Except it doesn't quite work because how do you do minimization over a function? So actually, we tweak this a little bit. We think of this as a my function f is tunable. It depends on its input and also on some parameters, w, that are tunable. And now we try to find a setting for the parameters that makes the objective as small as possible. And now I have a minimization problem because those parameters are some continuous variable. Okay. So I can use gradient descent, all the techniques I know and love, to find um, a minimum to that because this function can be evaluated for any choice of parameters. And it can also, here's a key property of neural networks, they're differentiable, so you can compute the gradient. And those two facts let you use gradient descent. So what does this have to do with machine learning? Well, let's suppose I want to build a classifier, and I know that on input xi, it should receive label yi. I just think of that as this curve fitting problem. And I do the same thing. Okay. All right, so that's neural networks. I think that's all I'm going to say. That's all you need to know to understand how to attack them. All right, so let's talk about the examples I was showing you, adversarial examples of, of you know, I showed you images crafted to fool the classifier. Let's, let me, let's talk a little bit about how you generate those. Well, about three years ago, I guess, um, folks discovered that you could craft these adversarial examples. And um, here's how you can do it. We want an instance, like an image, X, that ought to be labeled school bus. It obviously looks to you and I like a school bus. But the classifier will classify as a hummingbird. How do we do that? We start with some image that really is a school bus. And then we look for another image that's really similar to the starting one, but that gets labeled as a hummingbird. And if two images are really similar, then as humans, we'll probably label them the same thing, we'll know they ought to have the right label. So that ensures it's really similar that we'll end up with an image that to a human looks like a school bus. And so we're just searching now for an image that's really similar to the original that'll get labeled as a hummingbird. All right, so the problem statement is to find an X that has small distance to the original image, but that the classifier labels as hummingbird. Okay, so now we're gonna take the classifier for granted and assume we know the classifier F. And let me show you how you can formulate that mathematically. And here's the irony. We're going to use the same tool that makes the enables neural networks is also the same tool that breaks them. So mathematical optimization techniques can also be used to craft adversarial examples. We can formulate this as a minimization problem. The problem of finding an adversarial example becomes find an x that minimizes its minimal distance from the original image, subject to the constraint that it be classified as a hummingbird. So that's a minimization problem. Unfortunately, it's not yet in the form that we can apply gradient descent because of that such that 
clause. That such that clause is like this highly nonlinear constraint that says it has to be classified as a hummingbird. And gradient descent doesn't let you do that. But no problem. There's a slight tweak you can make, standard technique, standard move in the optimization literature, which is that I move that into the objective function. Okay, so I define a function g that will be small if the image is classified by the classifier as a hummingbird and large if it's classified as anything else. And it's not too hard to construct that from the output of the neural network. And then I just add that penalty term to the objective function. You get penalized a lot if it's not classified as a hummingbird. And now we have a function that's differentiable, so we can go find a minimum of it. And that minimum, empirically, gives you the kind of attack vectors I wish for. Okay. So you now know how to craft adversarial examples by using minimization. How are we doing so far? Yeah? Can you do it with only black box access to the neural network? Awesome question. So the, the starting point, these, these simple attacks require knowledge of the neural network and all its parameters. Um, in practice, you might not have that knowledge. Yeah, so I'm gonna get to that. Um, there's uh, several results. There's some results out just this year showing how to generalize this. So you don't need to know the parameters given only black box access. And I'm going to show you another technique that will also work called transferability in just a moment. Anyone else? All right. So let's talk about defenses. Suppose I'm unhappy with this, and I'd like to make a neural network that's robust against these kind of attacks. Can't be easily fooled. There's a lot of defenses you could start to imagine. But before I talk about them, I want to talk about what I just mentioned, transferability. And then I'll come back to defenses. So I promise, give me five, 10 minutes, and then we'll talk about defenses. So transferability is a second fascinating phenomenon that was discovered about adversarial examples. Here's what it is. Suppose that I train two different classifiers for the same learning task. The task might be given an image, recognize what it's an image of. But I train two different classifiers starting from two different training sets. And I generate an adversarial example for one. Then often it fools the other as well. And this is kind of a surprise. It's kind of interesting. It suggests that these optical illusions are somehow robust, that, that they're not capturing just a very specific element of one particular set of parameters, one particular classifier, but that they fool, they fool other classifiers trained to, that are trained to try to do the same thing, at least other ones if they're also neural networks. Okay, so these are somehow generalizable. And then here's the even bigger surprise. Here's the one that I just could not believe when I read it in the paper, and I still, still, some days I almost can't quite believe it. This works even if your two classifiers use entirely different architectures. Let's say one is a neural network, and the other is some entirely other kind of machine learning method a support vector machine, maybe it's a decision tree, maybe it's a random forest, maybe it's something else. You come up with adversarial examples that fool one type of classifier, and not infrequently, they fool the other one too. And I have no clue why this happens. I find this utterly mysterious, yet empirical fact. Okay, so this is transferability. And there's been a bunch of papers that are starting to explore why this happens, and as far as I can tell, we have no clue why this happens. So here's an example. Here's an example from a paper that I cleared this year. Um, the uh, image on the left is original image. It's an unmodified image that gets classified by a commercial classifier. Um, this paper attacked a online, um, who was it? Clarify, I think. Uh, online service that does image recognition. And it gets correctly classified as by a dot. Pretty cool. On the right, they show the result where they generated an attack, modified the image so that the clarify classifier now classifies it as window. And they did that without having any idea what the parameters, the tunable weights for clarify's classifier are. In fact, it's not even 
entirely clear what fully what the architecture used by Clarify is. How did they do that? They trained their own classifier on their own training set, their own neural network. They attacked their own neural network and generated an image on the right, and then tried it out and showed that, in fact, that also fools Clarify's classifier, even though the commercial classifier was trained with a different training set, maybe different architecture to the neural network. All right, so you can generate adversarial examples that, that fool many classifiers. So now let's talk about defenses. So a variety of defenses that might occur to you. The first thought is maybe, maybe, maybe if we keep the classifier secret, then it'll be secure. The attack I, I told you about requires knowledge of the, the parameters and the weights. It's kind of an unrealistic assumption that the attacker is going to know all the, the parameters and the weights of the neural network I'm using. So, but you know, first paper's got to start somewhere, some assumption. So what if we just make sure that we don't reveal what those parameters and weights we're using are? Is that going to help be secure? Well, I hope the answer by now is clear why I showed you the transferability. The answer is nope. That's not secure because of transferability. You can keep your classifier secret, but I can train my own classifier, generate attacks on my own classifier, and because of transferability, often those will fool your classifier as well. Okay, so that doesn't work. Next thought you might have for how to avoid getting fooled is maybe if we can inject some randomness into our classifier so that we randomize the, the, the construction of the classifier, then it's unpredictable what classifier you'll end up with. Um, you'll end up, if you train classifier, you'll end up with a different one than if I train one because we'll have different randomness. But again, does that work? No, because of transferability, right? Because transferability says that often adversarial examples uh, transfer from one to the other. So I can generate my own random one and it has a decent probability of fooling yours as well. Another approach that researchers have tried is saying, let's defeat gradient descent by making sure that you can't compute gradients. Let's do something so that the network is no longer differentiable or you can't compute gradients or maybe you can compute gradients, but they're somehow hidden or cloaked or they no longer give you relevant, useful information about which direction to, to go to minimize the function. Um, there's a variety of papers published that, that seem to fall into this, into this space of trying to, to make gradient descent hard by making it hard to obtain any useful gradient information out of the network. You could imagine various ways to try to do that. Unfortunately, does that work? Nope. That doesn't seem to work either. Maybe by now you can guess why not. You've heard me say it like 17 times already. Why doesn't this work? Transferability. Because even if your network is non-differentiable, if you, your network has been you know, tweaked to make it hard to compute gradients on, I can train my own network using an architecture that is differentiable, apply gradient descent on my network, because mine is differentiable, get an adversarial example, and then often it will transfer to yours as well. Another approach that researchers have started to explore is maybe we can use machine learning to rescue machine learning. Machine learning is great at distinguishing between type, two types of things, so maybe we train a classifier to distinguish, recognize this image is a normal image, this is an attack image. Let's learn to distinguish between those two by creating lots of attack images and, and, and training a classifier on normal images and attack images to try to distinguish the two. And if you try it at first, it looks like this works. Actually, I can't tell the difference between those two school buses, but a classifier can learn to, interestingly. So does this work? Sadly? Nope, 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 nope. Still doesn't seem to work. Um, still not secure, and the reason why is because that second network that's a detector is probably also differentiable. So it's like in 
economics, they have this principle that um, once you start to use a metric to evaluate people, then it ceases to be a useful metric. Like if I get a bonus every time I fix a bug in some code, I'm going to come up with all sorts of clever ways to make sure I get lots of bonuses. Even if that means inserting extra bugs in my code. Once you measure it and act on it, people it ceases to be useful because people optimize against what you're going to act on. Well, it's the same thing here. An attacker, once you start using the second classifier to detect attack images, can optimize their attacks to fool fool the second classifier. So you just add that to your objective function to ask gradient descent to find me an image that will be classified as, as a hummingbird and also that the second classifier thinks is benign. They're both differentiable, so you can do that, and it turns out you do that, and now um, you defeat the defense craft adversarial examples that fool both classifiers simultaneously. Fooling two of them simultaneously is not that much harder than fooling one. All right, so a lot of the obvious defenses you might think of don't seem to work. So what can we do? I don't know. Right now, this is an open problem for the field. Um, there are uh, papers streaming out at a rapid rate faster than I can read them. Maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 dozens a month, it seems like. And uh, as far as I can tell, there is no defense that I'm aware of that's uh, known to be effective um, for, for general learning general learning tasks. So this is an important open problem for the field. Uh, if you're a researcher who works in this area, maybe two that I can suggest as baselines to compare to. One is adversarial retraining, where we generate attack images and then we add them to the training set with the correct label in hopes that the, um, that the, the network will learn the correct label for them and, and generalize to other attack images. It works a little, but not nearly enough to, to be effective. Um, and uh, Recent paper from uh, Madri et al. also worth looking at as a baseline uh, level defense. Okay, so there's one big problem for the field. How are we doing? Any thoughts? Discussion? I'm about to move on to something different. There may well be there. I yeah. So the question was. Can we use maybe differential privacy style ideas to add noise to the image before classifying it in hopes that that would defeat these, these defenses? Um, there have been some, some papers that have suggested um, adding noise to the image um, before you try to classify it in hopes that um, you'll no longer get fooled. For instance, you could try blurring the image um, before you classify it in hopes that these uh, perturbations sort of average out. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the techniques that I've seen don't work um, if an attacker is aware you're doing that because an attacker can, instead of saying, find me an image that gets classified as a hummingbird, now the attacker says, find me an image that when blurred be is classified as a hummingbird. So it's easy to adjust the attack. Perhaps there's some more principled way to do it that I haven't thought of, so I don't know. But right now, I don't know how to, how to make that work. Yeah, maybe it, is. it does feel like a coding problem. We want we want nearby things to be decoded to the same value, but but now we have a like a super complicated. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Maybe someone here will figure out how to do that. I've wondered the same thing too. I don't know enough coding theory to know. Yeah. Is there work on, on in, uh, improving the interpretability of the models? Because they're kind of black boxes, hard to understand why they're making decisions. There is work in the machine learning. That's a big, that's a big uh, area called explainability. And um, I'll let you go read up on it. Yeah, there's some cool ideas out there. All right, one more question, then I'm going to keep on going. And we'll have time. Yeah, you know, just uh, I think this is very interesting. But uh, the things here is, uh, I guess, before we can understand, we, we, before we can try to find out the real defense, maybe we should first find out the real attack. And um, the example you gave is very much like you have printed out the pictures that you might as classified to do classification. But in the real world, the situation could be very different. 
maybe something looks like indefensible in theory. Well, in the real world, you have a lot of constraints which can perfectly defend against those attacks. Right? So I, I, my feeling is the understanding of this problem in the real world setting is still very shallow. We don't understand what can really be attacked, what can't. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, is a, this field is basically three years old. So there's so much we don't know. And it would be great to understand better how to make robust. I think what you're talking about potentially is making robust attack images that will work despite the distortions that are introduced by cameras, by lighting variation, by differences in pose. Yeah, yeah. People have only just recently started to study study that. All right. So I want to talk. Move on to talk about another challenge in this area: model extraction. Here's an interesting thing you can do with attack you can do on classifiers. Suppose that we're given black box access to a classifier. Was suggested earlier. Maybe the parameters are not available to us, but there's some cloud API where we can send an image and get back the classification. Uh, there's a series of papers that have shown that that is enough to recover your own classifier that's basically just as good as the one in the cloud. How do you do that? Here's one simple idea you could imagine, simplest idea possible, is obtain some unlabeled images, some images where we don't know what the labels are, send them to the API to learn what their labels are. Now we've got a training set that we can use to train our own classifier. OK, and that works. That works. One downside is it seems to need a fairly large training set, so you need many queries, but it works. It absolutely works. And it works even better if the Cloud API gives you not only the label, but a confidence score for it. If you have a confidence score, you can actually, it gives you a lot of additional information. There's more recent work on reducing the number of queries if you are rate limited, if you can only, if it costs you to make queries to the Cloud API, um, on how to choose the best queries to send to the Cloud to get labeled, to add to your training set so that you reduce the number of queries. And I'll just highlight one paper that's appearing here that describes how to do that um, and uh, manages to reduce uh, the number of queries needed. For instance, on MNIST, the training set, typical training set would be about 50,000 images, but they can, with an order of magnitude smaller number of queries, assemble a carefully constructed training set that lets them get a classifier that's, well, not quite as good, but pretty close to as good and good enough, crucially, that you can generate adversarial examples on your own personal copy that transfer to the cloud version. Okay, so this is an alternative way to go attack um, a classifier if only you have black box access to it, is learn, query it, obtain some examples, learn your own, learn your own classifier, attack your own one, and that will probably I don't know of any effective defense. So right now, um, the advice is, if you let others query your classifier, in the long run, you're probably effectively making your classifier public. Um, and also, this is a second reason why defense is based on keeping the classifier secret seem on thin ice. It's, it's not clear that that's going to work. Related, turns out, that if the attacker knows your classifier, I just said that if attacker can query your classifier, they can effectively learn what your classifier is. What are the consequences if an attacker knows your classifier, like knows the weights and the tunable parameters? Interestingly, sometimes they can reconstruct partial information about some of the instances you use to train it. Sometimes. Here's an example that I liked looking at a facial recognition system that was the purpose is the input is a face and the output is the name of the person. So it was trained on a bunch of images from a bunch of people, trained a classifier to do facial recognition. And this paper shows that if you have access to the classifier, if you know the weights, you can take someone's name and basically run it backwards through the classifier and ask, look for an image that will get recognized as John Smith and reconstruct an image of that person's face that, as you can see here, is not perfect. The original training set had that image. Here's the reconstructed image, but it's still recognizably that person. How do you do that? Actually, it's <laughs> embarrassingly easy. Uh, it's optimization again. Uh, you take the classification function, which will give you a confidence score, confidence that this is John Smith, and you look for an image that is makes the, cla the classifier say John Smith as strongly as possible. 
you're maximizing the confidence score. That's just an optimization problem when we know how to do that. All right. So one implication there is if you're training based on some private data, um, you might not want to make the classifier public because it might be possible for someone who has access to your classifier to reconstruct partial information about the private data from the participants who supply their data. So this is concerning if you're starting to use, for instance, I don't know, patient records from a hospital to train a classifier for making medical diagnoses, that now that classifier might actually reveal private information about the individuals who supply training data. And based on the model extraction attacks I talked about before, uh, even just letting someone query your classifier might be problematic if your training set has private data in it. So that's unfortunate because it's off, it's pretty frequent that we would like to train classifiers on data that might be private. So what can we do about that? Well, you mentioned differential privacy, and here's where line of work differential privacy can come to the rescue, and there's been some really interesting ideas on how to make the training process differentially private so that to address exactly this problem, to make sure the classifier does not leak information about private, privacy sensitive information in the training set. Doesn't leak training set instances. Because often we might want to include private data in the training set. So the goal you might have is that the classifier, the weights of the classifier, or the output from the classifier, doesn't reveal anything about any single person's data in the training set. If my data is in there, it shouldn't reveal anything about me. Or at least not too much. And differential privacy proposed provides a, a formulation which we can rigorously mathematically define what that would mean. But basically it's that uh, if you were to train a classifier with my data or without my data, um, and you looked at the, class of the probability of the classifier doing anything, you looked at the observable output of the classifier, the probability of that observable thing happening, probabilities are approximately the same whether, regardless of whether my data is included or not. How can you do, how can we adapt training uh, deep learning to provide differential privacy? Well, there's two nice ideas in the literature. One from CCS last year suggests that during training, when we do this gradient descent and we're stepping around to minimize the function, we're descending the hill, add a little bit of random noise. So instead of going in the downhill direction, go in the downhill direction, but randomize the direction we make a little bit. And if you make sure that you don't take a step too far anytime you take a step, and you add a little bit of randomness, then it turns out that this provides differential privacy and ensures that each instance in, any one instance in the training set can't influence where you finally, where gradient descent finally ends up too much because the noise cloaks the effect of that single instance. And it works pretty well. You have some loss in accuracy when you train in this way. And unfortunately it makes training take a lot longer um, but you can get uh, provable privacy guarantees if you want to include private information in your classifier and end up with a classifier that now you can safely public, publicize, publish without risking a privacy breach of the you know, participants who provided data for your training set. Second approach that I really like, that first approach requires some, some math to prove that it works. Here's a second one that that you can see why it works without needing any deep math. Suppose I want to train a classifier on all of your data. What I can do is I can uh, divide you up into 100, 100 groups. So there's about five of you in each group. In each group, we take the data from that group and we train a classifier on the prediction test. So we end up with 100 classifiers. And now, and now to classify a new instance, we're going to take the majority vote among what each of those classifiers says. Classifier 1 has the first five people. Classifier 2 has the next five people. We're going to take a majority vote and use that to make uh, predictions. So that's a simple way you could make predictions if you had a, a cloud API. And crucially, you can notice that um, this is very, that any one person's data is very unlikely to change the outcome of the prediction, because any one person is only present in a single group. So they can only influence the output of one of those 100 classifiers. So they can only change one of those votes. And we're taking a majority vote among 100 votes. And what are the odds that, that changing that one thing is going to change the final, final majority? And if you like, you could throw away the instances or do something else to get rid of cases that are a tie where changing one vote would change things. 
So that lets you reveal predictions um, to others in a way that doesn't risk revealing private instances. If you also want to publish the classifier, then what you can do is you can train a whole new classifier on a new training set with public data that's labeled using this prediction approach, using majority votes. Beautiful idea. How well does it work? It works surprisingly well. As long as you have enough training data that, that, each, that you've got you know, lots more training data than you need, then each of these 100 classifiers is pretty good, and you end up with something that has only a modest reduction in, uh, in accuracy. Okay, so that's how you get privacy. I want to talk to you about another problem that you might think about, I think is industrially relevant. I mentioned we might want to use private data in our training set. In general, we might want to use crowdsourced data in our training set. Our training set might contain data from lots of different sources. Like if it's a self-driving car, Tesla has sensors in their cars that's reporting back to headquarters about what they've seen in each person's car. That's how they assemble a lot of training data for their algorithms because they've got, what, millions of customers and they can use training, they get training data from all of them. So that could be a powerful technique to get lots of data about the world. But now you need to start to think, what if one of those people that's supplying data has like hacked their car or something and is supplying maliciously crafted data? Well, it turns out that there are attacks where an attacker who can supply a small number of instances, add them to your training set. If it chooses them just right, can have a large influence on the classifier, causing the classifier to, to make errors in some specific situation. Basically, introducing a backdoor into the classifier. So that's unfortunate. So what can we do about that? Well, there seems to be a beautiful solution in this, to this, which I haven't seen in the literature, which is, remember that differential privacy idea I gave you? Gives you not just privacy, but I think also defense against training set pollution. Because differential privacy promises that any one person's data, my data, won't have much influence on the output of the classifier. In the privacy side, we were concerned about influence because it might leak information about my private instance. But now, now we're concerned about influence because of integrity. We're concerned that it might radically change the output. Nonetheless, differential privacy promises that the won't be much influence of any one instance. Any one instance in the training set can't change the output of the classifier very much. So all those same those two ideas I showed you before, I think could be used to protect against training set pollution. So training set pollution is a kind of an emerging direction that is only just now starting to see uh, people explore both attacks and defenses, and I think we'll probably learn a lot more about this in the coming years. Last, there is a whole range of work on AI safety. If we start to use machine learning in safety critical systems, um, and I'm not an expert, I'm so not an expert on that literature, but I've started reading some papers and there's some really fun stuff there. and. Um, if we have time, ask me in the question and answer session, and I'll tell you about the big red button problem, which I think is a fun problem. But I wanted to make sure we have time for discussion and questions. So I think that I'm going to conclude here and open the floor. So in short, the takeaway from this is I think machine learning is going to be really important to society. And so this is a call to arms for our community. Let's think about how to make it secure. your great presentation. I have a um, couple of questions. You mentioned to the methods that uh, try to find a perturbation that is transferable. It means that we like to find a perturbation uh, such that can fool the other students, but we have no idea that the other students is. So we don't want to make queries. It's a constraint that we have. So we need to have what our uh, local data sets to learn the CNS. And the idea that to make a transferable perturbation is that learning perturbation on multiple CNS, right? So it's like the learning perturbation on ensemble of the CNS. 
So we went, uh, then we, make, we can make sure that the, this um, perturbation is transferable and can fool the other CNNs. But the main problem is here is that to generalize a perturbation, we need a lot change in the image. So the quality of the image goes down, right? So just consider the method that you propose for as a defense, like ensemble of the CNNs. So as mm, the proposed method that you mentioned uh, and published in the ICLR 2017, you can learn perturbations on the multiple CNNs, and you, you can say that it probably fools the other CNNs. So in the, the method, you have multiple CNNs, and you want to defend against the, this kind of the, uh, perturbation. But still, we know that with the high probability, it can fool most of them. So this uh, uh, method can work well. But I think the, the, this idea has a, some uh, disadvantage. For example, for the means data set, we have image 28 by 28. So if you have the all of the CNS, you can learn perturbations such that fool all of them. Even uh, you don't have any idea about the CNS. So for a larger image, probably we need a lot of CNN to defend against kind of the attacks, right? So it's somehow hard to say that, OK, I can learn 1,000 CNNs just uh, you know, using majority voting, voting to defend against these attacks. I'm not sure if I caught all of that, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because I read all of these papers that I want to. <laughs> Uh, just summarize all of the idea and make sure that we are on the same page. <laughs> I think what I took away from what you're saying is, first, there's a variety of work we could, different techniques we could use to try to generate adversarial examples that will be especially likely to transfer well. Yeah, but I'm and saying that th this defense doesn't work because uh, they prove that you can learn perturbation on the multiple CNNs and such that fool all of them. So if you have uh, multiple CNNs and using uh, majority voting and you publish your CNNs, probably the other ones can learn perturbations. If you want to hide them, so kind of it's working, but it's still, if you, the other parties can uh, have their data and learn the perturbation and make your CNNs uh, to, to misclassify them. So I think that this doesn't work. Okay. Thank you for the question. I, I think we're going to have to take some of the longer discussion online so, so more people have a chance to ask questions. Oh, okay. I just uh, think. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mariana Raikua, Yale University. Uh, uh, I have a question related. You seem to contrast the differential privacy approach with the approach where you split your data and you use different. Uh, uh, classifiers for each of the uh, training sets, and then you take majority voting. So my question is, can we view this as a different construction for differential privacy? Because differential privacy is a definition of security, not, not necessarily a particular construction. So can we think of this method as a different way to achieve differential privacy and try to prove the same guarantees for the outcome of this uh, way to, to, to train your models? This? This approach here you're referring to? Yes, that's what yeah, I'm Yeah, you're asking, to. can we think of this as an approach for differential privacy? Yep, exactly. Indeed, I, I, I probably did a very poor job of, of framing this. Uh, think, the way I think of this is this is an approach for differential privacy, and then you can go try to prove that it meets, that it does indeed provide differential privacy. And, and um, you can look at the papers that I cited that do some analysis of showing that it provides differential privacy. And I've left out some details. I just showed you the idea of the technique, and I didn't show you any of the analysis that goes with that to prove that it is differentially private. Yeah. OK, thank so you. So you have to do some analysis to show that, yeah. Julian yeah. from Penn State. OK. So you can create, say, some port to for a classify. And because of the transferability, you can create, say, some port to for multiple classifier. My question is, can you guarantee all the classifiers generate the same ROM output? Can you guarantee the other classifiers generate the same wrong output? Not yes. just that they're wrong, but also they're wrong in the same way. Yes, right. Yeah, it, it looks like it looks like um, these adversarial examples uh, off can be crafted so that they 
they not just make the other classifiers wrong, but they make it wrong in the same way. Um, these are not 100%. These, you know, they don't transfer 100%. The, the, they might fool the other classifier only some fraction of the time. Um, looks like that's possible. I think there's a lot more to understand about transferability. I, 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 so I, I don't feel like I fully understand it, and I'd love to see more work on understanding what are the limits. Is it specific to a learning task? Um, yeah, these kinds of questions. About it. So basically, there is no general guarantee, right? So I'm thinking about like a defense. It's that's right. That's like right. A, like a set of a classifier, and there, if their results are inconsistent, then I report a potential attack. Right, right. I understand what you're trying to do. Run multiple classifiers, and if they if they don't all agree, then then say, oh, I might be under attack. And um, I don't think that's going to work very effectively because you can generate transferable examples that will fool all of them in the same way. Okay. Um, but uh, I think you're really at something, which is there seems to be a strong connection between defense against adversarial examples and transferability. When I first learned about it, I thought of it as two separate things, but hopefully this discussion sort of gets at that maybe transferability is like somehow partly the heart of stopping adversarial examples. And if we could stop transferability, then then, then now we could we'd have a good shot at defending against adversarial examples using the kind of techniques you talk, you're talking okay, about. Okay, got you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I uh, I changed a little bit what I wanted to to say and ask because of the discussion already. So uh, the discussion uh, reminds me probably this, you know the alchemists at their time arguing how to turn silver into gold because the area is so new. And we are already, the classifiers are already not understood by themselves. Like, uh, uh, we know that uh, if we want uh, error type 1 against type 2, we get uh, different type of classifiers. And so inherently, they are not understood. Not now with the attacks, it's another layer of, uh, of misunderstanding. So there's a lot of work to do. And we're probably going to see the usual trend, a lot of attacks now. Attack papers and attack papers, and hopefully we'll get some understanding and get, get more scientific in in this sense. But um, but my comment is what to do. I mean, there there is no uh, you you propose no mitigation, and I'm not I'm not sure. I'm asking if there is, but but in in the case that there is no mitigation or no serious mitigation, we probably should take those classifiers, see the system that they are embedded in, embedded in and the utility that they bring, and apply the laws of robotics to those uh, extended systems so we get no harm and they don't harm themselves and so on, and really work on, on, uh, on, on such systems. But the problem is that the industry is rushing after money and not after safety and not after robustness and not after these things. But, so it's the role of scientists to, to take care of, of this. And my question is... Uh, what mitigations are there now, besides what I say, which is on the system level rather than on the uh, process level? I love it. I love it. I love what you're saying. How, we don't even understand why neural networks work at all. So if we don't understand why they work, how are we going to hope to understand why they don't when they don't work? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I like the ideas you're talking about, about maybe just assuming if we're going to use it in a broader system uh, from a safety perspective, assume the worst of the machine learning and try to make sure the rest of the system is resilient. Um, I, there may be other mitigations one could explore. Um, for instance, uh, many of these attacks seem to be possible because the inputs are super high dimensional and that provides a lot of degrees of freedom for the attacker. Maybe in some specific cases, some you could use domain-specific knowledge to identify that really there's only a few key features that are needed, and so I'm actually in a low-dimensional space, and now I can use a machine learning method or some other method where I can understand what's better, what's going on. It's more predictable. Um, in uh, some work that my group is doing, we're looking at um, uh, malware classification and trying to make it so it's hard to fool. and um, uh, using our domain knowledge about there, we're able to identify that there's a more restricted threat model. The attacker can't change all pixels arbitrarily, but some features can only be changed in particular ways. And that now opens up an opportunity to try to design classifiers that um, resist that particular threat model, this more limited space of modifications or perturbations that an adversary could plausibly make. 
But the short answer is, I don't know. And that's why I wanted to come give this talk is to draw attention to this fantastic work and hope that it inspires other people to come up with some great solutions. Thanks. Uh, Rakesh Baba from Oregon State. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I have one question, um, and again, this maybe it's not just reflected on the slides, and it's a wonderful summary of what's going on. Many of the both attacks and defenses seem to be tested on these two um, classifiers, MNIST and CIFAR, um, and they're really small um, data sets and you know really small um, classifiers. Um, do we know that the that this is transferable to larger um, classifiers, and you know if, if it is, or maybe it's just you didn't present it and you just showed values for those. E either either is fine. Yeah, just wanted to get some clarity on that. Yeah, it's it's a great point. MNIST um, is sort of the the hello world of machine learning. It's this very small, simple thing that that um, you know other more complex learning tasks may not be representative of other learning tasks, and and often you'll find the first papers will start to work with these simpler simpler data sets or smaller data sets that are easier to work with. Um, so far, I've, I've seen some, some work that seems to suggest the transferability business also seems to happen on other more complex data sets. But I'd love to see more. I still have this little wonder in the back of my head of, we know it's not limited to just MNIST, but um, is it possibly different for some training sets that we, for some kind of tasks we haven't looked at? We do know that um, MNIST is quite different from more complex tasks in some ways. MNIST is basically black and white. It has some funny features. So we've started to see some examples of defenses that are effective on MNIST, but that aren't effective on other tasks like CIFAR and ImageNet. Um, so you gotta be a little careful. Just because your defense seems to work on MNIST doesn't actually mean that it's a, it's a generalizable uh, defense. Uh, MNIST seems to be easier to defend. So you're absolutely right to raise that point. Yeah. yeah, because some of the things we've done seems to show that transferability still exists, but the effectiveness reduces as you go to larger classifiers. Maybe we could talk talk about it offline. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Thanks for your talk. Um, so at, at some level, humans are classifiers, right? And um, so, and I, I doubt there was anyone in, in here that was fooled by the school bus picture. So... That, that kind of tells me a couple things. Uh, first of all, that there's some limit to the transfer of probability, which you've already alluded to that. But it also brings up some other interesting questions to me. Um, first, first of all, and I, I don't know what the utility of this is, can you come up with uh, examples that would fool a human in the, that case, right? Um, and is, is there something where you can, you know, put humans back in the loop. Uh, obviously, you know, going back to crowdsourcing is defeats the purpose of machine learning in the first place, but are, are there solutions and things you can study about transferability that include that human factor? Yeah, that's a, that, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's another intriguing uh, approach at defending against this, which is rather than using a completely automated system, involve a human in the loop, maybe not on every decision, but if you could identify a small fraction of instances that require human review, maybe if my system started to get attacked, then over time um, it could respond. Uh, humans maybe, if, if there's some way to select out the right ones for humans to review, then maybe the system could adjust and adapt to the defense. Um, and indeed, there's a, a, a lot of work in the machine learning community on how to involve a human in the loop Taking into account that we're limited, we can't, we, you know, we have a limited bandwidth and our ability to, you know, our willingness to label, label things. Um, it's called active learning. Um, there's a lot of powerful techniques there. And um, some of my colleagues have done some really nice work on uh, using active learning in the malware classification setting, where they showed that um, they could train uh, machine learning uh, methods to, to detect malware and do a better job than current static antivirus solutions. Um, uh, if they were able to use a, an analyst, an expert analyst, to uh, manually label, review a small number, like maybe 50 malware samples a day, suspected malware samples a day. Um, uh, so 
there, the algorithm could pick out a small number of samples that if, if only we could get a human to label those would really help improve the quality of the results. So that's intriguing direction. Right. Yeah. It, do, do you think it would work in the other way? Do you think you could use these kind of techniques to fool humans one way <laughs> yeah, or another? Yeah, it's fun to speculate about, you know, could we generate better optical illusions against humans? Right. It's not clear how to do that because, you know, our parameters are not accessible, you know, uh, black box attacks on this is going to be hard because you can only make a few queries to me before I get tired and bored. Uh, I don't know, but maybe someday <laughs> someone will apply these techniques and generate, okay. generate better Thanks. optical illusions. Uh, Wen Yuan from Zhejiang University. So, great talk. So, um, it seems like um, from your talk, it seems like machine learning is doomed, not because of transferability. If you think about it, uh, it's kind of like a lossy compression, right? You take a bunch of images and you get um, a few features and then you think that's it, you can do the classification. So, it, it, does that mean from this perspective, there won't be any defenses to protect machine learning? Algorithm. This mean there won't be any defenses. Tell me again why it would mean there won't be um, any defenses. Because if you think about how the whole algorithm, it's like a lossy compression, right? Okay. The data set is huge. You uh -huh. extract features, uh -huh. and you think these features are representative enough to um, tell you what this thing is. But um, from your presentation, it seems like they're not, because we can fool this classify. So I'm saying that because of the lossy compression, so um, there won't be any defenses to protect machine learning, unless you find a way to classify that does not depend on training. I don't know. I don't know what we can conclude. Um, there does seem to be some like blind spots in the current classifiers. I, maybe there's a diff better way to do it that doesn't have the same blind spots. I don't know. Thanks. Mm. Uh, hi, David. I would like to explain why uh, differential privacy is not considered to be an effective defense against against data poisoning, because differential privacy deteriorates rather quickly with the number of samples which are introduced, and it's by design, it's a feature of differential privacy, not a bug. And in data poisoning, uh, if you can inject uh, one sample, why wouldn't inject 10, why wouldn't inject 1,000? So in data poisoning attacks, kind of a uh, ability of the adversary is measured in fractions of the data set. And uh, this is mostly, I'm kind of chose to speak up, mostly to prevent the community from writing papers that demonstrate the differential privacy doesn't work against this attack that it wasn't, it wasn't really designed to prevent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So you're saying differential privacy might be effective uh, if we, against a uh, training set pollution that involves one polluted instance, but it's That's not correct, going to yes. be effective against that have uh, a fairly large number By design, of, yes. Of, yes. of polluted instances. Wonderful, thank you. Um, hi, David. So I just wanted to, uh, I guess, ask a follow-up question to Shai's question. Um, so I'm curious, so if you, how hard or infeasible for these deep learning uh, techniques would be to introduce a constraint, assuming optimistically that the training set is kind of far apart, to make sure that at least on the training set, everything kind of, in the close proximity to the image will be classified the same. So I guess the first question is, is it feasible actually to add this constraint? And two, I imagine it wouldn't be a universal constraint because you cannot have everything the same, kind of you can go from A to B and if you keep outputting the same. So do you yeah. think, uh, you know, if it's feasible, do you think it might be effective or it would still like minor tweaks would still uh, allow us to construct this adversarial examples? Yeah, I think I see what you're getting at. I, let me try and see if I got it right. Yeah. I think the idea is around each training set instance, we know the correct label, but also sort of any ball around that right. training set instance also ought to have the same label. Right. And so I should think of my training, think of like asking for a solution that, that forces everything in that right. ball to have that label and right. do that for all the training right. set instances. And would that help? Um, and the problem is, the problem is that like this is the curse of dimensionality. We're in such high dimension that you take a point and a small ball around it, and you do you take your training set, and you've covered you haven't come anywhere near to covering the space. Those are super sparse in the entire high dimensional space. So we need we need still need a network that generalizes to handle not just this ball around this training set instance and this ball around this training set instance, but what happens when we get a new point that wasn't near either the training set instances. That's the wonderful thing about neural networks is they generalize to, in, to new images that aren't you know, close to any of the training set instances. And 
It's not clear how to make sure that those get the right label. And if you do the naive thing of, of, of adding a constraint during training to enforce that everything in this ball has the, has the same label, you could train a neural network to do that. And you'll find a neural network that has that property. But because neural networks have more capacity than they need, basically what happens is it's constant in here and it's constant in here, but that didn't really guarantee anything useful about other test instances that aren't super similar to a training set instance. So it didn't really guarantee that there are no adversarial examples on other test instances. So it wasn't really what we wanted. So you're saying it's actually feasible, but probably not effective. But it's right. not what we quite what we wanted, yeah. Uh, yeah, for this is probably more of a comment. Um, so from what we see so far, the example of the adversarial uh, are, you know, it's a neural network that is trained on images, right? Because that's the easier way to do. Um, and it's also yeah, it's easy for us to understand. Um, so, and we compare new, uh, you know, machine learning with humans, right, basically. Um, and I think part of the problem is that machine learning look at pixel granularity where human look at higher whatever, right? So many different layers of thinking about it. Uh, so, so it might not be fair to compare it that way unless we try to, it, to, try to uh, make the machine learning kind of em somewhat emulate what human do. Otherwise, then uh, this adversarial uh, example can always be there. I don't know what you think about it. Yeah, maybe images are different from other kinds of learning tasks. Maybe. I didn't talk about it. There are also a, a range of papers that are uh, doing, looking at other uses of machine learning for malware classification, for voice recognition, for um, uh, text, like natural language processing, handling sequential data. And that's a little newer. Um, but we're starting to see that these same kinds of attacks also seem to be present in those domains as well. Um, sometimes it takes some new ideas to generalize the attack. So I don't know. It remains to be seen. But my hunch so far is that this is not specific to images and that we're going to see similar effects in other domains. But it'll be good to, good to learn. Really short. Uh, some of the work reminds me of uh, uh, bagging and boosting methods that have had some success in using uh, uh, conditionally independent sets of features. And it seems to me that, uh, that perhaps it's, if you can find these conditionally uh, independent sets of features and, and build classifiers on those separate sets, that perhaps there's something in there. I'm just wondering if there's any work along those lines for, for, uh, for a defense to adversarial examples. Because your example is sort of a, you had a bagging um, example in, in your scheme uh, too. And so it seems to me, and that's something that you don't usually use in any kind of neural network uh, approaches. You sort of throw it all in there and hope it figures it out. But if you, but there have, there have been other approaches that uh, in the literature that predate the, uh, uh, some of these approaches. Yeah, an ensemble of classifiers where each classifier is looking at a small subset of e the features. Exactly. And maybe yep. those, each one of those wouldn't get tricked in the same way. Yeah. This is the thought. So you haven't seen anything on that yet. M maybe there's, I don't know. I, there's so many papers that I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So maybe what? it's, I think it might be hard to do in the image space, but maybe in other application domains, maybe there's more hope for trying something like that. Thank you. Intriguing. All right. So uh, let's uh, thank David for the very talk.